Death is big business in this country. We're not just talking about the funeral industry or even areas where death is a regular event, like healthcare and law enforcement. From entertainment to art to antiques and collectibles, death is a major part of Americana. Without the tension, the drama, and the other emotional responses that death evokes, our culture would be a lot less exciting. When you think of culture, one of the first things that comes to mind is museums. More than 20 years ago, a California couple decided that death deserved its own museum. J.D. Healy and Kathy Schultz started off on a slightly more mainstream track. It wasn't just one day we woke up and said, Museum of Death. We, it was an evolution. My husband and I, we had an art gallery down in San Diego, the Rita Dean Gallery, and we dealt with a lot of provocative uh, um, themes, death, sex, drugs, religion, anything that made you know, buzzwords. And the building was an old mortuary that the gallery was in. Uh, we did artwork and letters from serial killers. And in, during that time, we were also writing to serial killers. And my husband was visiting them mm -hmm. on death row. The business of galleries, it's a hard business, and especially in San Diego. And we said, you know, what's the next best thing? Museum. So it's not every day someone says, yeah, I was writing all these serial killers and getting art and letters from them. And these were big names too. John Wayne Gacy, Richard Ramirez, David Berkowitz and the like. But just like your first ride on an airplane, your first taste of lobster, your first kiss, your first acquittal for solicitation charges. Oh, what a night that was. Well, um, just like all those other firsts, you never ever forget the first serial killer who answers your letters. Oh, which one was your first? Gacy. Gacy was your first? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. he was a real jerk. Oh, well. How would I, I guess I, that, I, right? I, 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 <laughs> Why I never didn't I would know? Have he, see, he seemed like such a mellow guy. Oh my God, he was <laughs> such a jerk. He would call, call collect at <laughs> four in the morning, <laughs> in the middle of the night, because I guess that's when he got privileges. So I would cuss him out on the phone because I'd be the one that answered. My husband never answered. I'm like, you, you know, blah, blah, blah. Stop calling me. And then he would call back in the daytime and speak to my husband who would accept because we actually were his West Coast art rep. <laughs> Gacy had an art rep. Oh, wow. I know, right? Uh, he never got the money, just mm -hmm. so you know. Or most of them didn't. I'd send them $10 for their birthday or for Christmas or something like that, or postage stamps, but we never actually paid them. Um, so that's why Gacy would threaten my life all the time and tell my husband, don't I know who he knows? He's the, he knows the mafia and they're going to kill me. And <laughs> Who's here now? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> the California Museum was highly successful, and it's no wonder. A place like this is a great way for people to get comfortable, even for a little while with the idea of death. Of course, everyone has a different comfort level. Our guests come through and they have to process everything, all of this, in an hour. Right. It's overwhelming. And we have, we have people pass out, literally hit the floor. And it's hard for, unless you see it, it would be, it's hard for you to even think that that's possible. But it's just so overwhelming. I had a Marine down in San Diego, fell on the floor and busted his face up. And I ran over to him like, oh my God, are you okay? And he's pushing himself up. He's like, yeah, I'm fine, bloody lip and all. I'm like, yeah, good answer. And his buddy was standing next to him and I go, hey, uh, what's up? He's like, oh, we were at the gym and he's really dehydrated. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah right. right. <laughs> <laughs> but people, they do get embarrassed by it, by mm -hmm. you know feeling so overwhelmed. But again, it, you should be, you should feel overwhelmed. It's, it's death. This is hardcore stuff. In the museum, is there one exhibit that most, more people tend to flock to? That would probably be serial killer artwork. Okay. Right, thank you. Well, welcome to the Museum of Death serial killer room. And this is awesome. Yeah. I can't believe it because I was in journalism for 25 years. Yeah. I reported about a lot of these people and to yeah. associate them with art it's just, it's a little creepy, and yet I feel like it would give me insight into what is going on in the mind of a serial killer. Some do. Uh, some are just childish. Mm -hmm. Some of them actually take it seriously and do pretty good work. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they train themselves in prison. If you're going to be there, might as well do something. Mm -hmm. Casey used to call me, like yeah. I mentioned in the interview There's before. There's Casey. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he dressed himself up as a clown, Pogo the Clown. Mm -hmm. And weirdly, years later, I mean, this is... Um, the artwork he did, but uh, this anti uh, like an antique dealer in the Midwest said that he came across these things 20 years ago, and 
he thinks they were Bundy's shoes, mm -hmm. or I mean Gacy's shoes, and he thought, and, and he had some other artwork from him too, and he just donated it. And not knowing, Pogo the Clown shoes. Oh, there we are. Oh my gosh. We Just haven't found a photo that. yet of uh -huh. them, but I know it's out there. I'm sure that we're going to validate these. And just, you know, a lot of times to validate, just get the history of who, who got it, where do you get it from, how did the auction happen. And so we, we really take pride in that, knowing where something comes from and validating it. I always research what they did while I was writing to them, so I had that fresh in my mind. You know, oh, they killed these kids. You know, like, remember who these people are. Right. And they're jerks. Yeah. So. Basically, you yeah. know, there's, it's hard <laughs> to find a redeeming quality in anybody like that. I don't know, but then there's, you know, uh, Ramirez Richie. <laughs> he was funny, and he wrote fun letters, and you know, you start, you drop your guard on those. Mm -hmm. Elmer Wayne Henley, a nice guy. But he was took part in killing twenty nine of his friends. You know, yeah. <laughs> like how does this happen? So you it's know? almost like they have a dual personality. Thing. Yeah, I, I think a lot of them do. You know, uh, and they're a lot of them. Are, they're very charismatic to get away with what they've done. Mm -hmm. you know, they've got to cover their tracks and be charming, like Bundy. Right. So it, it is. They're all individual. That is one thing I can't. You know, we generalize them as serial killers. Yes, they're do, that's the one act they have in common. But each one is very individual. Well, here we are in the execution room. Mm -hmm. Point out a few of my favorite pieces. <laughs> uh, behind me here, this is an actual sh outfit worn to the electric chair in Louisiana when they still did electrocution. Mm -hmm. uh, and my favorite part, they cut the pant leg off because the ground clamp, they need some place to put it. Mm -hmm. And that's when they, they put the, cut the pant leg off, so that's when they put the ground clamp. Oh my gosh. So they can, electricity needs mm -hmm. a place to go mm -hmm. out of you. Uh, another one, our head of Henry. That is a real human okay. head. And Henry, Henry was is? Henry um, Henry Landrieu, mm -hmm. pretty famous guy in his day in Paris. In the 20s, he would uh, marry women, and on their honeymoon, he would buy a one-way ticket for them and a round-trip ticket for himself to go on their honeymoon. Mm -hmm. And actually, that's how they convicted him, because it was premeditated. He knew they weren't coming home. And he would take their fortunes, these little, little, little older, wealthy women, mm -hmm. and they eventually guillotined him. Oh, and, wow. And uh, the, the executioner got to keep the head. Mm -hmm. So I have to ask you, when you mm -hmm. have things like this, like human remains, how, how do you actually get them physically into the store? I mean, the postman doesn't just knock on the door and say, here, sign for this, and there's a head. Good point. <laughs> Well, uh, uh, do they? Yes, they do. Okay. <laughs> All right, they do. Okay. We do get ads in the mail. Oh. Well, skulls, not heads. Okay, heads just, you know, just skulls. The great thing about death is that it touches everything. So the Museum of Death doesn't limit itself to displays focusing on just humans. Well, none of us look our best after death, but sometimes we <laughs> exacerbate the situation, especially when it comes to animals. I'll tell you, I get mixed reaction from this room. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite rooms because I love animals so much, and I, I, none of the animals were harmed. They, mm -hmm. But animals die too, just like people. Right. But a lot of people come out and they, I can't go in that room. I'm so sad. Which and, is, <laughs> and this is just all taxidermy. Yep, yep. And there's some pet taxidermy, but there's what, game taxidermy as well. Mm -hmm. My husband gets on these kicks, uh, but he went on a puppy kick. Mm -hmm. Hence the puppies, 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 oh. puppies, everywhere, puppies. Wait, that, that one there, these are all real puppies. Puppies. These are all mm -hmm. real puppies that are taxidermy. Which people get really upset about. Um, there's like uh, people in the SPCA, they'll drive up the price on eBay. They'll start mm -hmm. betting, uh, bidding, 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 mm -hmm. and then they won't buy it. But it'll bid JD out of the market. Mm -hmm. Then they always contact him anyway and he gets it. But taxidermy can be very done very poorly. Yes. And I have an example right here. If the hide isn't tanned well, you make a leather jacket out of it, basically. It takes about nine months to make a leather jacket out of a skin. And this obviously wasn't. Mm -hmm. And she was, uh, uh, these people were raising miniature horses, and she was, uh, she died at birth. 
so she's even more miniature. And they thought her their little three-year-old would just love Missy as a rocking horse. Mm -hmm. They got Missy home, and the kid screamed, <laughs> "I don't want that. That's ugly." And I so mean, I don't, I don't know, but who thinks it's a good idea to present a dead, preserved animal to your child as a <laughs> toy? Death is a big concept, too big for a single museum. Eventually, Kathy and JD decided they needed to expand. So if you were looking for a place to open a second museum of death, what's the first city that comes to mind? New Orleans is a dark town. I mean, it's we've got more dead people than we do live people. I mean, we're surrounded by cemeteries. People come here already wanting to do cemetery tours, ghost tours, vampire tours. It's definitely a dark city, so adding you know something like the Museum of Death to that roster of things to do is definitely an attraction. When you walk into the museum's New Orleans location on Dauphine Street, you'll get a litmus test on your tolerance for what's in some of the displays. There's a photo of a graphic accident at the register, and if you have trouble with that, you've been warned. Some of the things you see on your tour could really get rough. Is there anything you know of that they would not put in the Museum of Death, something that goes too far? Typically, we don't do anything um, on like school shootings um, because nobody really wants to look at pictures of you know kids slaughtered in a school. Um, that said, if we were able to come across artifacts, like Columbine, for instance, like if we could, had one of the trench coats that they wore, that's something that we could put up that wouldn't be over-the-top graphic that would allow us to tell that story. We're not here to gore people out. We're not here to just, you know, beat you over the head with, you know, gross things and crime scene photos. We're here to educate, so we do try to, you know, keep it down to a reasonable level. We love entertaining people and we love inspiring them to do better and do more and never take life for granted because we will die and don't you don't want to have any regrets at the end you know, do that bucket list the Museum of Death has an amazing collection at both of its locations but maybe you don't want to just look at someone else's collection maybe you want one of your own one of the best places to start is a little shop in Manhattan called Obscura Antiques and Oddities. It's located in the colorful East Village, once home to notables like Quentin Crisp, Abby Hoffman, and Joey and Johnny Ramone. We met with the owners Mike Zone and Evan Michelson. They've been in the business a while and have also appeared on their own TV show, Oddities, which ran for five seasons on Discovery in the Science Channel. Their mission was to track down hard to find items from taxidermy to obscure antique medical equipment, and in some cases, things that incorporated human remains. And they definitely had the know-how and the resources. Well, it's hard to really pinpoint exactly what our critique is for what ends up here. I mean, we do medical, scientific, natural history, the odd, the unusual, the curious, but it's an aesthetic. And, you know, it's, it's the expression. You know, I, I can't explain it if I know when I see it, it's that. There are things in here that don't fall into those general categories, but you know, we'll be at a market, you see this item, you're like, this is a beautiful item. This just has the look, it has the feel, it has, it's just right, even if it's not one of our many general uh, areas of, of collecting. Yeah, I, I call it resonance. I have to fall in love with something. And I only buy what I like, so it's not a good business plan in general. It worked out really well here, so I have to fall in love with something. And it, it has to speak to me. It has to have a story to tell, uh, as most of the things in here do. And, and, then, of, and of course, the problem with that is you want to keep it all. Well, that know? is a big problem. <laughs> that is a big problem. We both have issues. I, I'm constantly swapping things out of the collection. I'll be at a market. I'll find something. I'm like, this is amazing. I can't sell this. Mm -hmm. And I'll look in the collection. I'm like, you know, I've had this for a while. I'll bring this in instead. And so it's constantly rotating in and out of my collection and into the shop. I bought something yesterday at a market. It was a Victorian. Um, it was a bracelet and hanging from it was an alligator foot with beautiful silver work and clasp. It was dated 1870s and I cleaned it up and I was like, I'm going to bring this in tomorrow and I put it on. <laughs> and uh, it's That's it. Off. It's yeah. over. What, yeah, what? it's over. I mean, what you see in here, people often ask like, oh, could I be a picker for you guys? Could I go bot shopping for you guys? It was tell people, you could send us pictures of stuff that we buy, but everything you see here has been bought by Evan or, 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 my, or me or myself. Uh, you know, we go around, we look at stuff, everything here is a piece of Evan or, or, or a piece of me. It's like, you find stuff, you're like, this is, you know, so it's very, it's, it's, it's a little personal, actually. It's, it's really our aesthetics. It's our likes and loves of things and our, you know, what, what makes us interested in item. The store is about, it's about, Death, it's about life, it's about magic. Uh, I don't mean like, you know, that, I mean like like mystical. It's, it's about all this stuff. It's about, it's about life. It's about the, the, the big everything. 
So certain things, like Evan said, have things have a resonance to it. Things have a feel to it. Things you look at and you're like, what is this? And why is this? And why is this here? And who did this or kept this? The, like by the time like you're out of here, you should have more questions than when you started. You've heard the phrase having good bones, and Obscura has plenty of those for sale. We'll get to that in a bit, but let's talk about the building now. Real estate is hard to come by in Manhattan, so it's often take what you can get. But there's a little serendipity with what Evan and Mike got when they relocated their original shop here. This, this building is actually is a funeral home. Uh, started around 1900 to 1995, you were standing in what was a funeral home. Uh, I found a great article from the teens about a woman who killed her husband in this very, uh, right where we are in this building. Uh, all this stuff, we have things like Ouija boards, we have a lot of former people in here. Uh, we have remains, all medical of course. Uh, we have bits and pieces of people's lives and loves and, and people. Nothing's flying around, nothing's yeah. moving, nothing's, nothing's <laughs> ever been haunted, but there was one time a person brought these corrective braces. They're called polio braces for a child. And they were and little. They, they were, were tiny. little tiny things. And she came back in and she said, I'm returning these and we don't have a return policy, but under these circumstances, she said, I brought them home and I heard little footsteps and it kept me up all night and these things are haunted and I don't want anything to do with them. The weird thing is though, they're polio braces, so this kid couldn't walk, so be odd that you would hear <laughs> footsteps in itself. So she was very upset, so we, we took them back. And then right after she walked out the door, another guy in the shop said, you know what, I'll take them. Turns around and like, the door didn't even close yet, I'll take them. He wanted the ghost, but when he got them home. Yeah, about a month or two happened. later we asked, you know, you gotta tell us, did you hear the footsteps? pissed off that they did not. Yeah. Like, nothing. I didn't hear a thing. It was... Ugh. But we make no claims. Maybe they don't have to make claims. Maybe it's enough to know that some of their merchandise is intimately connected with death. We want to warn you, some of the images you're about to see, yeah, blah, blah, blah. You know, by now, you should know this is a series that has a lot of creepy images. So without further ado... Human remains are a tricky subject. I mean, we do carry skulls, we carry medical stuff. Um, there's a fine line there. There's certain things in, in human remains you can have 100% legally. There's things that you should not touch, bother, look at, think about, or contemplate because they're insanely illegal. Things like American Indian remains. You cannot buy, sell, possess, trade, barter, whatever. That stuff is federally protected, has been for, for decades. That's a big no-no. If you find like a skull that has like dirt on it, like you know, it, no, no, thank you. A general yeah. rule in life: don't disinter anything. Exactly. A, you cannot disinter a grave. That is also a felony. There's a lot of the shrunken heads. There's actual tribal Sansa heads, the, which was a tribal person killed in combat. And then there's what they have, which are called tourist heads or, or uh, morgue heads, which were non-tribal people not necessarily done by the Havaro or Shuar Indians, uh, that were made to be sold. Again, these were made as tourist souvenirs. I mean, high-end and strange and macabre, certainly, but you, these were not cultural heritage that was plundered. All the skulls we have are medical skulls. They come from uh, doctors. Often in medical school, they'll have a, an actual skull to learn the anatomy of the head. So you can tell they're medical. They have springs. They're all wired together. We're not held together with wires and, you know, It's straps. amazing people ask They'll be holding a medical skeleton in their hand and they'll say, did someone dig this up? It's like, well, you know, those springs are not anatomically correct. Those little hooks are not holding yeah, the top of your head on. Yeah, that's not how we're actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, well, we also have like the, the exploded skulls, the Beauchene skulls. Uh, the one on the right is actually from what, the 1940s, 50s, Yeah, mid-century modern Beauchene. And it's basically an exploded view of the human skull. Uh, the tricky part of that is actually getting the skull apart because of course, skulls grow together. The longer you're growing, the tighter they are. Uh, so they have to separate all the pieces, which is difficult. Apparently what they do is they fill it with rice, dry rice, and they pack it in there, and then they put it in water. And as the rice absorbs water and expands, it pushes out and will actually pull the plates apart of, of your skull. Well, in the case, we have some lovely post-mortem photographs. And of course, those were fairly common in the 19th and the early 20th century. They still Actual do them post today. Not yes, we, we don't have um, <laughs> fake or assumed postmortems. Just because people were standing very still doesn't mean they were dead. That's a common misconception. There are many uh, sort of uh, facts that are either misappropriated 
misapplied or just a lot of general nonsense when it comes to postmortems. We're very, very careful. And, and it's interesting because of postmortem, sometimes the line between life and death is almost impossible to see. This is something Mike is passionate about. He collects postmortem photographs and is very active in online discussions about them. But you know, the body was prepared by the family. They would prepare, they would dress uh, clean, do the whole thing. They call the photographer in, take a photo. The vast majority of things, they're laid out, they're in a coffin, they're laying down, they look dead. Sometimes their eyes are open, sometimes they're closed. Sometimes the early ones you'll see little something dripping out of them. Sometimes they have cotton shoved up their nose. Sometimes, you know, they're in awkward positions, but like clearly dead. This is a gentleman in his coffin laid out. This is from about, oh, turn of the century, give or take. Uh, here's another one, another, oh, another man in his coffin laid out. This is also about the same age. This one's from Texas. Uh, this one is an infant. Uh, laid out. It is not in a coffin, but uh, looks like on a, like a bed or some kind of little thing like that. And this one's a little bit later, uh, later in a coffin, surrounded by a million flowers. Probably the most interesting piece we have, certainly a piece that many people find striking, is that medical mummification on the top shelf under the dome. And that's actually the second one we've had. Um, we had one years ago. I think Mike and I both actually regret selling it oh, absolutely. but the face was anatomized and it swung open on a hinge it was a beautiful beautiful thing and the anatomist was actually tattooed behind the ear but it's a medical mummification which is interesting because it's not a ritual mummification it has no greater spiritual meaning it its meaning is it's a teaching aid basically and that's become kind of a store mascot we actually have a snow globe we made of that mm -hmm. uh, our new t-shirt design has that head people ask to buy it that one's not for sale. We like to have a few items here when people come. Uh, they want to see the real oddball stuff. They want to see the real interesting kind of stuff. So we always try to keep a good number of pieces, really museum quality things on hand for people to ooh and all at. And then uh, everything else is for sale though. Everything else includes a lot of things most people don't think about as antiques. Because when you think about an antique, you typically don't have to worry about, say, accidentally poisoning yourself when you touch them. Fortunately, Evan and Mike are meticulous about making sure everything they sell is safe. Well, we do a lot of medical items. Um, you know, anything, an instrument, we always clean stuff off. We get sometimes things like proctoscopes or uh, rectal dilators or things of more intimate nature that those, you know, gloves and detergent and definitely clean those off. Who knows? You don't know where, well, you do know where they've been. and. Just to be sure, you don't want to be handling yeah. that without any kind of preparation. We don't handle radioactive materials or um, early x-ray <laughs> machines or anything of that nature. So we're... And as far as like the, the medicines go, the poisons and stuff, um, usually if it has the contents, we leave them. I mean, we're sealed, we tell people do not open that. Uh, you people ask, well, this is a poison, how could you sell that? I mean, you could go to the hardware store on the corner for a lot less money and buy a big giant box of rat poison, like right now. And so if someone was gonna do something nefarious with it, something wrong, they would go there and do that. They wouldn't buy a little bottle for you know $80 of some little poison bottle, which probably has so little in it, you could just make yourself sick and of that. Overwhelmingly, the people who buy them are medically related. They're doctors, they're nurses, they're homeopaths, so they know what they're handling. Maybe this line of work is a bit off, but maybe we're all a bit off in some way. And for Mike and Evan, that's okay, after all. Doing what you love for a living is the best kind of business. We're just people who love what we do, and a lot of us are kind of on the outside, a little bit off right. the grid. I mean, there's no reason that you can't be fair in this business. Some people like pigs. They want every last penny. You know, if you could buy it and sell it and make some money and pay the bills, excellent. That is, <laughs> you keep doing that. Yeah. It it's yeah. a great thing. The people who sit on things forever and wait for that last penny out of it, you're going to be buried with that thing, like literally buried. I mean, no one's going to buy it. You'll have it forever. So, you know, just... To, to be fair, I mean, I want everyone to be happy. We're happy with the deal, they're happy with the deal. Everyone walks away happy. I like to be upfront about the things that go on with this show. So it's time to be upfront now. While I was at Obscura, bought a little something for myself. This is one of the post-mortem photos Mike showed us. Some of you, maybe most of you, will probably consider this gruesome. It is, after all, a picture of a dead baby. But to me, it's just a reminder that while our fascination with death has changed a lot over the years, it's never waned. We've just shifted the focus of our fascination every now and then. And keeping things fresh, even when talking about death, is what keeps life interesting. Many of the things we've seen so far are one of a kind. 
They're unusual pieces that ended up at places like Obscura and the Museum of Death because they're unique. You could even say some of them were just happy accidents, or at least accidents that eventually made someone happy. But death also inspires artists to create not just one or two pieces, but a whole new realm of work. We met one of them in Philadelphia, who isn't afraid to tap into the imagery of death to express what's going on in life. Uh, so last December, uh, I did an exhibition here at the Arts Department called Better Ghosts, and it was a play on kind of the, the visual and kind of cerebral simplicity of the idea of a ghost and like a kind of a child's interpretation of ghosts uh, versus, you know, the more kind of, I guess, emotional look, how you look at the past with like rose-colored lenses and just kind of holding on to things from your past as far as like looking at those kind of remnants as ghosts. It was a simple, more innocent interpretation of kind of maybe darker things. I've also always really been kind of obsessed with the past and just like that sentimentality of things. It's, it's a big part of my life. And, um, and I, I kind of, uh, my art tends to have darker undertones, but also it can have these like, you know, these simple images in contrast with that. So it was just kind of a natural progression of what I was doing at the time. This ghost kind of being bullied by children, you know, it can certainly uh, be trying to uh, kind of make peace with something, you know, like, I guess, uncomfortable parts of your past. And there's also, um, I guess there's another piece of, of a ghost laying on a mattress with sleeping pills on, oh. on the nightstand. And it, he, I guess that one kind of gave up the fight against the past. My work tends to really use visuals associated with death as far as uh, there's kind of a kinetic violence to a lot of pieces and um, you know I, I'm, there's a recurring theme of bones and blood and not so much in the ghost show but um, that's always there's always that kind of darker current through my work. The reason I take a darker approach to my work is kind of I guess just uh, my worldview. Since I was a child, I've had like, uh, you know, problems with depression and stuff like that. So it's kind of, it's just, you know, this that's like the part of an outlet for that. And it's kind of just the projection of how I feel at times onto paper. Uh, people's reaction to my work seems like uh, some people just react very strongly to it immediately. And, um, you know, I, th I feel like some just kind of are like, okay, well, that's not my bag, and just continue on. Um, and some people can be convinced to like it if they, they like to stick around and hear an explanation for it. I feel like because of a lot of the imagery I use, it's not, uh, it doesn't, you know, it's not this like really uh, immediately palatable thing, and I think it, my audience is more niche. A lot of artists are, are using darker imagery and stuff. I don't think that's something that I, you know, am, am breaking the mold doing or anything like that. But um, yeah, I mean, I'm still I'm still finding out what my audience is, I guess. Have you ever thought about taking death into your bed? Now hold on a minute before you answer. I don't necessarily mean death in this form, a bony figure with a scythe. Although, I suppose that the bone is the right size and in the right location, it could be kind of fun. What I'm talking about is a personification of death, a personification that's sexy, compelling, and oh so persuasive. And as a bonus, they're guaranteed to be out of sight by morning, so no breakfast dishes to wash. Now who on earth could I be talking about? Oh yeah, that's what I'm talking about. What? I have a thing for capes. 
and for someone with plenty of experience. Vampire history uh, started probably before recorded history. That They've always believed in, in vampiric type creatures, creatures that, that come in the night and, and take one's essence or blood. But however, the word vampire didn't really appear until the 17th century and the 1600s. And then we start seeing it appear in, in Eastern Europe. John Edgar Browning is a professor and ethnographer at Georgia State University. He's published or contracted more than a dozen books on the supernatural including vampires. Centuries, millennia ago, people assumed that blood had great power. They knew when people were, were cut severely and this red stuff poured out, life poured out, and they died. So if you could put the blood back in, then it would cause this thing to stay alive or this person to come back to life. Well, John Polidori is the vampire in 1819, 1820, became the first sort of novel with this main character who was a vampire, Lord Ruthven. And again, he was a vampire who wasn't unattractive. And that became the first time where it gave people the idea, maybe we can start setting these people as, as main characters and not make them these repulsive corpses, which is not something that people want to read about or be attacked by. It changes the tone of a novel completely when that happens. And so throughout the, the 19th century, the 1800s, you start seeing a few novels and a few short stories appearing. Each one does pretty well. Carmilla by Joseph, Joseph Sheridan Le Fanu did really well. But Bram Stoker's Dracula took, I think, a lot of the best qualities and then added more really great qualities. And that novel just became you know, ground zero for the culture that would appear in the 20th century. People didn't start thinking of, as va of vampires as being human and walking around and, and integrated into society until books like Carmilla came along. In fact, Dracula especially was the first major work to really cement into people's minds that the, the vampires could be human and be this way. And so in, in book reviews of Dracula, you constantly seeing the reviewers have to qualify this as the human vampire. Back then, vampires were still perceived as something that was in the grave and it was a corpse or it was a vampire bat or a creature. So people were more taken aback by the fact that, that this was a human vampire than the fact that it was a vampire period. It's been well over a century since Stoker published Dracula, so we're pretty used to the idea of a human vampire now. But not everyone is a fan. For other cultures, and, and still to this day, the vampire is not something to be taken lightly. It's not something that's played around with. And, and, and there are cultures and villages that are you know, deadly afraid of this creature. And it, it, it may still have sex, but does not have the sex appeal that we now associate with it. It, it, it represents death. And to this day, there was a reported case of an exhumed body in Romania in 2006. Uh, the people were arrested for grave. Uh, disturbing the grave and, and, and whatnot, but they did take the, grave, the, the body out and they did take out its heart and burn it and drink it, and that was the only way they could have stopped these visitations by their dead relative. But there are also the, uh, the Shangxi or Zhangxi in China, and it looks like what it is, it's a corpse. Uh, the Chinese don't even actually consider it a vampire, more like a hungry ghost, and it's more likely to eat you uh, than just strictly take your blood. And they also, we call it, or they will call it the hopping vampire because uh, of the way it moves. And because of the rigor mortis having set in, when it moves around, it looks like something hopping around because its limbs won't stretch out or move. They're not pliable. So um, when you see Westerners trying to interpret it and also make these Chinese films, you see this ridiculous hopping ghost or hopping vampire. How about some of the other things that came out mostly in Stoker? Now, there was a little bit uh, earlier that the vampire might transform into a, an animal or some other right. thing, but that really came out more in Stoker. And then he was, in Stoker, he was able to go out in daylight, right. but he had very limited powers. So can you tell us a little sure. bit about that? A few, uh, a few particular uh, uh, characteristics that Stoker gave us for the vampire, particularly what we see in Dracula, would be garlic. Garlic had always existed in folklore as being an apotropaic against the undead, but Stoker is the one that put it in literature. Stoker also is the one that kind of invented the idea of using the host or the body of Christ, the, the communion wafer, as a, a means of, of destroying Dracula's consecrated earth. But he had to do a few things to get away with that because, of course, when once a, the, the, the host becomes the host and it officially has the, you know, part of the body of Christ, then you have to consume it. You can't let it hit the ground. If, you hit it, if it hits the ground, you've got to pick it up and eat it anyway. So for a stoker to be able to use it, break it up and use it in coffins, uh, definitely rattled a few chains. 
uh, but it was done in, in the, you know, in the interest of saving people's lives and fighting evil. So they kind of let it slide. With a healthy dose of sacrilege getting a pass from the readers and critics, it should be no surprise that the sexual overtones in Dracula went over without much of a fuss at all. The mesmerizing eyes, the commanding presence, not to mention those little love bites on the neck. And back then, remember, you didn't put your mouth on anyone's neck unless you were married to them. So from that point on, vampires were linked implicitly or directly with sex. One of the themes that vampire literature and movies tackled long before the mainstream media was same-sex relationships between vampires and victims, and lesbians were at the forefront. There was a steamy shower scene between Catherine Deneuve and Susan Sarandon in the 1980s cult classic The Hunger. In the early 70s, another cult classic film, Daughters of Darkness, explored sexual relationships between a vampire, her female protege, and a newlywed woman. If you notice the resemblance between this countess and the one played by Lady Gaga in American Horror Story, good eye. But we can go even further back to the 1930s, when there were definite lesbian overtones in Dracula's Daughter that somehow managed to slip by the censors. But hold on to your wooden stakes, folks. It gets better. Would you believe implied lesbian vampire sex was written about in a popular book all the way back in the 1800s? When Carmilla came out, there definitely was this strange sexual undertone, but people weren't thinking gay, they, they weren't thinking homosexual. Then you really couldn't be gay, you could simply partake in gay or homosexual acts. And it was much more permissible for women to do this than it was for men. If, if, it was too, if Carmilla was about, if it was Carmelo, and it was about two men, uh, I think people would have been much more in, you know, uh, up in arms about it. Uh, but in, in, in particularly in British culture, it wasn't necessarily horrible even for a, a woman to, to sort of find practice uh, with another female in terms of developing relationship skills or whatnot or kissing. So, but it was still taboo, but it was not something you talked about or put in print, which is what Carmela did. And so it definitely raised flags in terms of particularly deviant sexuality, but these two women weren't looked at as being lesbians uh, as much as just two women partaking in an act. Just as the vampire genre took the literary world by storm, it soon moved to more visual mediums where it was even more successful. It was adapted into a play which attracted huge audiences in both Britain and then the US, where Bela Lugosi brought the character to life on stage. His performance won him the starring role in the 1930s classic film version of Dracula. By the early 1950s, interest in vampires was dying down, but just like Dracula himself, it didn't stay dead for long. Christopher Lee brought his take on the character to a new set of vampire films produced by Hammer Studios in London. For nearly 20 years, vampires were in. Really in. Well, at the tail end of the next big vampire Dracula boom, which would be the 1970 to 1975, at that point, Dracula films and vampire films were coming out by anywhere from 50 to 75 films a year. Those films from the early 70s included Dracula AD, 1972, The Satanic Rites of Dracula, not to mention Blackula, and Scream Blackula Scream, and of course, Count Yorga Vampire. Now who could forget that one? Well, I could forget it if my psychiatrist would give me those damn drugs I'm begging her for. Seriously, that film was traumatic. The genre bled over. <sighs> really, you want me to say that? It's vampires, okay. All right then, it bled over into TV, most notably with the hit series Dark Shadows. It was one of the earliest examples of betraying a formerly evil creature in the form of Bartimus Collins as a highly sympathetic vampire. It was one of the first times in mainstream media that vampires were seen as a potential good guy. For decades, Dracula and knockoff versions of The Count were pretty much the image people had of vampires. That changed when a new book came out in the 1970s. Suddenly, it wasn't just about the fangs, it was about the flair. For vampires in terms of literature, it's obviously it's Anne Rice. Anne Rice's interview with the vampire uh, served two really great purposes. It, it, blew up uh, the literary vampire. So we see uh, novels by Saberhagen, we see novels by Rice happening, and people were just really into that. But it also had the effect of creating fan conventions. 
Uh, we had Dark Shadows conventions in the early 70s, but eventually by the late 70s we have Anne Rice conventions. And, and these conventions attracted people who uh, began to identify with the word vampire. People who, according to them, consume uh, human or animal blood or take what they call psychic energy from people. Yeah, you heard that correctly. This isn't a headline in the tabloids or a prank to get your attention. There are people who self-identify as vampires, and not just for role-playing games either. It seems only appropriate for us to go back to New Orleans, where Anne Rice set her novels, to get a real interview with a real vampire. But he's much more than that. Hello, everybody. My name is Belfazar Shantisan. I am a sanguine vampire and a voodoo priest. Balthazar identifies himself as a vampire, but like many people who do, he has a day job, and he works here at Voodoo Authentica, a store in the French Quarter. This is not just a shop that sells trinkets for tourism. Look around and you'll see many colorful displays which are actual altars to the spirit of Voodoo. I always appreciate seeing other practitioners of Voodoo at work. Although his tradition varies slightly from mine, I immediately recognize many of the practices I employ myself. He begins by cleansing a bowl made from a dry gourd by dousing it with a perfume known as Florida water and setting it on fire. Today, Balthazar is making Grigri. These are small talisman that have a variety of purposes. The one he's working on today is meant to bring good health to the owner. Just take yourself a pinch. Both from the sides. Et voilà, on grigri. You might think someone who is both a vampire and a voodoo priest would be sinister, but Balthazar is far from that. Give him half a chance and you'll find he's warm, with a wry sense of humor and a lot of fun stories. As a member of the New Orleans Vampire Association, or NOVA, he's also intent on dispelling the myths and rumors about people who identify as vampires. In order to define a vampire, you have to define what vampirism is. Um, Vampirism, according to House of Mystic Echoes and the New Orleans Vampire Association, is a physiological condition wherein the person afflicted with it and using afflicted as a loose term uh, no longer creates enough of or doesn't create any of the basic essential energies to get through day. In other words, eating right, exercising, all of these things don't really pay the benefits of giving us the added energy that it would somebody normal. Um, so we have to pull our excess energy from someone else. I'm a sanguine vampire, so for me, it's a very physical world. Um, when I'm not feeding properly, uh, my eyes get dull, my skin gets ashy, my hair gets limp and lifeless. I become listless and lethargic and, and hard to focus. So if I'm not feeding properly, it shows on me physically. There is a difference obviously between human and animal blood. Can you explain what the difference is for you as far as how it fulfills your needs? Animal blood, in all honesty, doesn't fulfill my need. Um, most often you get animal blood, it's 20 minutes or more outside the body, so there's no life to it, so to speak. And for me, I take straight from the source. It's like wine. If you open a bottle of wine right away, you get more flavor, but if you let it sit after a while, flavor dissipates. One of the biggest questions we have is, where do you get the blood? By now, you've probably figured out that Balthazar doesn't meet the Hollywood stereotype of someone who sneaks into a person's bedroom at night to attack them for their blood. I've met donors everywhere. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite donors, and I actually met at a laundromat while I was doing laundry and had my laptop open, waiting on the laundry to, to get done, and I'm answering Facebook messages on one of our community boards and all of a sudden, wow, you're like that? Led to the conversation of exactly what it was, how it was. Um, he was like, 
Well, I don't think I'm one of those, but I wouldn't mind if you... It was pretty clear from meeting Balthazar in person that he didn't have any fangs. Maybe they were retractable? Nah. He and other self-identified vampires get their blood in a much less dramatic and much safer way. Um, I generally test my donors three times before actually getting with them the first time. It's all about a mindset and trust thing for me. It's not, even though it is about disease as well, it's all about a mindset and trust thing. If they trust me enough to go, te and go test or if I trust them enough to go test with them because I will get tested too, then it's easier to bond with so that the experience doesn't, pardon the pun, sour the taste. Can you walk us through the process? Because from my understanding, there is a great deal of safety precautions that you take during the feeding. Especially for me. I don't use a sterile technique. I use what can only be called a clean technique. Um, sterile techniques usually involve things like uh, butterfly needles and, and syringes and drawing blood. And it sounds like a chemistry lab. More like a, a mini hospital stay. <laughs> and I usually go behind the shoulder so that it doesn't scar, but it also doesn't show. But I cleanse the area really well with uh, alcohol swab, then I wash the area, then I use an antiseptic wash. So three different washes. Um, then I make my incision, drink, um, cleanse it again, Neosporin, Band-Aid, and I check it every three hours for the first day. When you make the incision, what do you use? I use an X-Acto knife. I have a specific blade that I like. It's more of a more of a point and definitely works very well for what I do. How much do you drink at any given time? At my most hungry, it's only ever been six ounces. So it's not like I'm running around draining bodies everywhere. Um, but on the average, uh, I do two to three feeds, and it's usually about a one, one to six ounces. Okay, you do two to three feeds during the same session? or Same week. Same week. In movies and books, there's also a recurring theme that vampires mesmerize people into getting their blood, and that eventually they become their slaves. The reality is a lot different. My donors, we're really good friends. You know, um, I take into account if they say they're not feeling well, which is why I have multiple donors, because I can go on to the next one then and say, hey, so-and-so is not feeling well. Um, but for the most part, that just depends on the, the people involved in the relationship, how far they want to take it, why they want to take it that far. So it's like any human endeavor, really. Mm -hmm. So a business person could be a close friend as well, or you could have two separate lives and just only encounter each other in the business life. Yep. What challenges do vampires face in just dealing with the everyday world, the non-vampire community? Honestly, I know three families that have lost their children because one or more of the family members have been outed as vampire. Um, I know people who have been kicked out of their homes. I know people that have been uh, suddenly unemployed because people find out. Do you know of any instances when someone has been physically attacked once it became known they were a vampire? I can list off about seven different instances that I've had to help out with. Another myth we dispel in this interview is that you can become a vampire. In fiction, that typically happens when a vampire drinks your blood, then gives you his own blood to drink. Have you ever had anybody come up and ask you, can you turn me? Oh my God, number one stupid question in the world. Yes, we've had that. Um, and yes, I've experienced that. The problem is, if it's not already in you, I cannot put it in you. This is not a communicable disease. It's not a sexually transmitted disease. So we're not contagious. 
Now what about that old story about waving around holy objects like a Bible or a crucifix to frighten a vampire? Well, actually, depending on the circumstances and the person who's doing the waving, that can work. Can you tell me about but that? But it wasn't foreboding from the cross. It was, that son of a, was nuts. He was gonna trigger no matter what. You could have said, hey, how you doing? Have a nice day. And this guy would have triggered. But he put that cross in my face and I was just like, okay, I'm gonna go this way now. I can understand why some of the myths were created. Vampires probably bumped into somebody like that and was like, uh -uh, I'm going that way. Oh look, my cross chased him away. And with simple self-preservation from someone <laughs> yeah. who you can see was just, you know, a few bricks short of a load. His Happy Meal didn't have the toy surprise. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great interview, and we were really honored to have met Balthazar. And I was curious what the rest of the crew thought, so after he left, we went outside for some fresh air and a debrief. We just got finished with our interview with Balthazar Ashantison, a man who self-identifies as a vampire. And I'm betting a lot of you out there are thinking exactly what I'm thinking. You seem like a really nice guy. You know, you, you think vampire, you think someone that's gonna put out a weird presence when they enter the room, someone that's gonna be kind of playing a role that you've seen on television. I expected it to be very stereotypical. You know, him and his entourage walk in, there's smoke coming up through the floor. It's none of that stuff. It's none of the Hollywood. You know, you're stereotypical, like vampire walks through the door, what South Park teaches you to be, you know. <laughs> You're gonna have, you know, black lipstick, nothing but black clothes, you know, just complete darkness, you know, fucking teeth and everything in their mouth, and that wasn't the case. He was a normal Joe, for starters. To me, it truly looked like an identity crisis. Not in a way that is a bad thing, it's just a man trying to come to terms with how he wants to view the world. There, there's this, like, psychological, sociological thing going on where this man is desperately trying to find who he is and what his place in the world is. And as a gay man as well, he's been ostracized, he's been stigmatized by people, and by adopting this vampire persona, it sort of allowed him to walk amongst the living, if you will. And something about that's really fascinating. The actual vampirism itself, like, I, I'm with Christian, I think it's more of an identity disorder, more so that than a medical disorder. I, I think sociologically it can be compared to something, but in regards to like a physiological dysfunction or, you know, disorder, it's just, I don't, I don't see the correlation there. And I'm not sure if I still believe in actual real vampires, but I also can't say that they don't exist either. There's still a lot of mystery to this element, and there's a reason why it's been used in so many different cultures and why it's so such a relevant thing today. And what we've really been talking about as we've made this documentary is that basically we're all the same. We're all just people. We're all equal on a fundamental level. Whether you're a mortician working in a funeral home, a death investigator who goes through hell on earth each and every day by seeing the worst ways people can die, a self-identified vampire, a necromancer who speaks and works with the dead, a nurse who works in hospice care with patients who know their lives can only be measured in months or even days, an artist who uses death imagery to reach out to the world, or a museum operator whose exhibits remind us that death is always waiting. We're all trying to do the best we can to get by in the world. We're all in the same boat, and ultimately, that boat has only one destination. So be careful before you judge others, because you never know who you might be sitting next to on that final ride.